Our mind's like a fire. Flames shooting out, thoughts shooting out in all directions. When we meditate, we're trying to adjust the flame so that it's steady. Focused on one thing, the breath here in the present moment. And trying to stay with it steadily. Start with a small flame. Find one spot in the body that's sensitive to the breath. One that feels really good when the breath is just right, and not so good when it's not right. Take that as your guide. Often this is in the area around the heart, but different people will find it at different spots. So find your spot. And watch it all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out. And try to get sensitive to, this, to the signs that it gives, that now is the time to change from in-breath to out-breath, out-breath to in-breath. And if you adjust it just right, there's a sense of smoothness to the breath, to the changes in the breath. And it's that smoothness that you then want to spread to different parts of the body. That's when John Lee gives another image. He says it's like a Coleman lantern. You may have seen them. They have these little bags made out of thread, white thread. And the kerosene comes out very subtly and bathes all the threads of the bags. So that when you light it, the whole bag is lit up. And the light is dazzling. Now, you may not get a sense of light in your breath, but try to have a sense that there are breath channels going throughout the body, and the breath is licking around those channels, flowing through those channels, and it's carrying that sense of smoothness in the breath through the different parts of the body. This way you take this tendency of the mind to burn. And remember, in the Pali Canon, when they saw a fire burning, they saw an image of clinging. Fire clings. Clings to its fuel. If you ever notice that if you've got the one end of a stick has a flame on it, if you try to shake the flame off, it won't go. It hangs on. The fire clings, and because it's clinging, it's trapped in that fuel. So you're taking this tendency of the mind to, to cling and to burn, and you're putting it to good use. Cling to one thing, cling to the breath. And don't be afraid of being attached to the breath. I remember reading a piece by a monk, of all people saying that you shouldn't do practice concentration practice, because concentration practice is focused on one object and it's an attachment to one object. Instead, you should let the mind wander around from object to object and just note where it's going. But that wandering around, as I said the other night, that's clinging too. It's not the case that holding on to one thing is the only way you can cling. As you go from one thing to the next to the next, it's like trying to cross a stream, going from one rock to another rock.
But if your mind is aimless, it's not going to get to the other side. It comes, steps to this rock, then steps back to another one, then goes who knows where. If you were to draw a map of the m movements of an ordinary mind throughout the day, it would be a huge mess. Tangled lines all over the place. What the Buddha is teaching here is a series of steps, stepping stones that will take you across the river, get you to the safety of the other shore. As you go from one state of concentration to a deeper state to a deeper state, you get closer and closer. So of course you're going to hang on, but you're hanging on to something that's useful, something that will take you in the right direction. And why is that? Because when you hang on to one object like this, you get to see not only the object, but you also get to see the mind in relationship to the object. You see how the mind state creates a state of becoming around the object sense of you focused on that object and the world in which you and the object exist. And you begin to realize that these, these levels of becoming are not a given. You actually create them. And getting the mind into concentration helps you see the process of creation, see the raw materials from which you create these becomings. It teaches you how to nip the process in the bud. This is one of the reasons why when the Buddha gives instructions on mindfulness practice, he says you put aside greed and distress with reference to the world, because wherever there's a world, there's a state of becoming. And so at first you're dealing with worlds outside. You want to stay in the world of your body right here, right now. Just your awareness, the breath, the body, the feeling of ease. Those are the things you focus on. Those are the things you emphasize. There may be pains and aches in different parts of the body, but you don't focus there. Focus on the parts of the body that you can make comfortable. So the mind gains a sense of wanting to be here, in this world, rather than traveling around to other worlds. Because this world is one that you can see the processes as they're happening, the processes of creating one becoming and then going to another and then another. And you can see what drives it. Then you can apply all those questions that the Buddha has you ask about things like this, which is, what's the origination? In other words, what in the mind gives rise to this? What impulse? And then how does it pass away? Because these impulses don't come in a steady stream. They come, and then they stop. They come, and then they stop. Again, think of a fire, a bonfire burning. The flames leap here, leap there, and they die down. Then they leap up again. And then you can ask yourself, why do you go for these things? What's the allure? And if the mind is coming from a relatively steady, state of well-being, where the breath is smooth and that smoothness goes through the body. It tends to be more honest with itself about why it goes for things like that. Distractions, states of becoming, that would pull you away from the breath. Then you can compare the allure with the drawbacks. And to realize that it's not worth it going for those things. You develop some dispassion. That's the escape. Now, dispassion is not aversion. Simply you realize you've outgrown something. 
This is how we outgrow our childish habits. There are a lot of things that when we're children have an appeal. But as you begin to grow up, you realize that the appeal is very meager and the drawbacks are pretty great. I mean, think of all the candy you ate as a child. As far as you were concerned, there was nothing wrong with anything sweet at all. And John Swat made that comment one time when he was a young monk. Went to stay with a John Mun. One day a John Mun complained that something was too sweet. And John Swat thought to himself, how can anything be too sweet? And then as he got older, he realized, oh, it is possible for things to be too sweet. In the same way, there are a lot of things that have an allure. Lust, anger, envy, all these unskillful states in the mind, they have their allure. If they didn't have that allure, we wouldn't go for them. But as you get more mature, you begin to realize that the allure is not worth it, because they carry a lot of drawbacks in their wake. That's what dispassion is. You're, you're developing a maturity around these things. And you're trying to make that maturity habitual. Because when death comes, and meditation is a preparation for death, you don't want to be foolish enough when the mind is desperate, can't stand the body any longer, and it just goes for whatever, and it sees something sweet or sees something flashing, and it goes for it. Without thinking about what the drawbacks might be. So you want to learn how to focus on the drawbacks. Remembering that if you go for X, it will carry Y and Z in its wake. And you think about all the drawbacks of Y and Z. No matter how alluring X may be, you realize, okay, it's not worth it. And keep that line of thought active, that way of thinking active, because it'll save you from a lot of grief. So when you adjust this flame of the mind, make it steady, you can read your mind. It's like fires outside. If you try to read by a bonfire, it's hard because everything is flickering so much. But if you adjust the flame, say you have an oil lamp and it burns with a steady flame, or you have a Coleman lantern with a steady, bright flame, you can read easily. It's the same with the mind. When you adjust the flame of the mind so that it's the, that steady flame of jhana, you can read your mind very well. You can see how it puts states of becoming together. And you can begin to anticipate different states of becoming that you've created in the past and you might want to go for in the future. And as soon as there's an inkling that the mind might head in that direction, you can already see where it's going, the whole story. You want to see the whole story as quickly as you can. I'm reminded about the story of Beethoven. He said that the idea for the Sixth Symphony came to his mind in a few seconds, the whole thing. As soon as the initial phrase came up, he knew where the whole thing was going. You want to be that quick in seeing where different states of becoming or different inklings of the mind might want to go for a state of becoming. 
would lead. And that way you can protect yourself from a lot of dangers, a lot of disappointments, a lot of wasted energy. So there are advantages to holding on to one thing, clinging to one object, and not just flitting around. You flit around, you don't learn much. But if you're methodical in where you focus your attachments, you can focus them on states of becoming that will be useful that will be the stepping stones across the river. So don't be afraid of being attached to your object. Because when you stay with one object like this, the mind does become steady. The flames, even though there's still some fire burning in the mind, it's a steady flame. It's under control. And it gives you a clear picture of everything that's going on inside and around.